Sermon 112, True Love Chapel, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 24. And uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we pray that you um, give us your blessing in our Bible study and our sermon. Uh, please help me. Please give me the inspiration with, through the Holy Spirit. And uh, please help us to learn from you, Lord God. We pray in Jesus. Amen. All right, so uh, Acts chapter 24. We're uh, getting towards the end of the book of Acts. Um, Paul's in a bit of trouble here. <clears throat> he's, uh, he's sent to uh, Felix, the, the governor. Um, and then we're going to actually be looking at his defense before Felix. And uh, basically he was, um, I mean, what was he accused of? He was accused of like stirring up the crowds, starting riots, starting, you know, just disorderly conduct and uh, things like that. Um, it says, uh, in the beginning of chapter 24 in the New King James Version, it says accused of sedition. So, I mean, sedition is uh, something similar to treason, um, turning... Um, just turning against his uh, his Jewish uh, you know way in the people the I mean Paul Paul was Jewish right initially he was a uh, Pharisee and then he became the Christian <clears throat> but um, anyway let's just look let's look at it and uh, from verse ten and uh, see what happens here and this is the defense before Felix then Paul. After the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things <clears throat> which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust." This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with Talmud. <clears throat> they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. All right, wow. So he's, he was accused, he was arrested, he's now defending himself before the uh, governor, Felix, and... Uh, <clears throat> um, and it's still unclear exactly what he was, you know, accused of. Where's the evidence? Where's the witness? The witnesses were not present. So uh, he's defending himself. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's telling them, bring on the witnesses, you know, let, let it be known. And uh, exactly what happened and bring out the witnesses and let them uh, state their case and all that. But no witnesses were found. Now, when you're, you're doing the right thing, you don't need to be afraid of evidence and uh, witnesses and things like that. You know, <clears throat> um, always being on, on a, you know, nowadays almost everything is like recorded on, on videos, cell phone videos or vi just closed circuit TV and all that. <clears throat> so any kind of incident, any fight or anything like that, chances are it's going to be on video. And, um, uh, you know, in police nowadays, they wear um, body cam uh, videos, video cameras attached to their body, and it's recording everything. And I think that's 
that's great. <clears throat> that's good because, uh, like, for the in the case of police, you know, they they have this tremendous uh, responsibility and this power, uh, this authority. But it, you don't want nobody. Nobody wants them to misuse, abuse that uh, power. So everything is recorded that they do, and um, and so just just that clarity, ha having things just out in the open. You know, you're not hiding. You're not covering up for things. It's in the open. So, and uh, <clears throat> now in the case of Paul, of course, they didn't have video cameras back then, but um, they had eyewitnesses, and they know that. You know, two or three eyewitnesses are the minimum. You know, to to establish something, and um, and really, you need to to question those eyewitnesses separately, and um, so you can see if they have conflicting stories or if they're telling the, the same thing. But <clears throat> but in this case, his uh, his eyewitnesses didn't even show up to court, and so he should have just been uh, released. And it, it goes on um, saying that, you know, Felix, ultimately, he wanted to do the Jews a favor. And so he left Paul bound. That was at the end of the chapter. After two years, so Portius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So can you imagine being in prison for two years when there's no evidence against you? Um there's no trial, no fair trial, no evidence, and then just being left in there. I mean, there's a lot of corruption that was going on in those days. You know, thank God uh, nowadays we have a <clears throat> a system of government which is supposed to be better, where we have due process and all that. You're guaranteed to have your day in court. They can't just hold you indefinitely without charges. But uh, at any rate. Just some, just some stuff that I was just talking about there. And then, um, <clears throat> so what I really wanted to talk about was, um, well, it goes on down. And by the way, Paul, I mean, you, you know how the story ends. He ends up going to, to Rome and uh, he, he appealed to Caesar. So Caesar at the time was Nero, Emperor Nero's. And uh, um, <clears throat> now the first time he met with Nero, he, uh, he must have given a tremendous testimony. And Nero rejected the testimony, but he also let Paul go. But then after that, it, uh, it sounds like what happened is uh, Nero just went totally crazy. And probably the, the devil himself may have possessed Nero. And uh, he became the... Uh, the beast that uh, Revelation was talking about with the triple six, you know, that that was a code for Nero because they couldn't just come right out and say Nero or, um, you know, they'd be hunted down. So they had to speak in code because of the great persecution. But uh, <clears throat> and if Paul had not of, you know, appealed to Nero, he would have also been let go. But he was let go after seeing Nero, too. So I don't know. I mean, but uh, wherever Paul went, you know, great hardship. He was he was faced with prison and beatings and all this, everything, um, for the sake of the gospel. And he was glad to do it, right? <clears throat> but um, when it, w w yeah, verse fourteen. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect. Now, the way was Christianity. It was originally called the way. And then later it was changed to Christianity. Just the name of it was. But it says, um, <clears throat> So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. Wow. So he's saying he worships the God of his fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, um, and it's the same God. And it says, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. So Christianity then is it's it's not uh, something different. It's a fulfillment of the, uh, you know, it's fulfill excuse me, fulfillment of Judaism. 
And uh, so I just want to, sh to show you some of this stuff I was looking at real quick about the messianic prophecies. And uh, so, and also remember when uh, Jesus appeared in his resurrected body, his, his resurrected state, he appeared to the disciples and he explained to them the scriptures, the Old Testament, how it is pointing to him. Like the entire law and prophets, that's the Old Testament, it's all pointing to Jesus Christ. The whole story here is, is a story of redemption in, uh, in Jesus Christ. So it's all pointing, you know, it was pointing forward to Jesus. And now we look back, we're looking in the epistles from Acts and uh, the, uh, the rest of the New Testament epistles and things. It's looking back on um, the work, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And um, so, I mean, Jesus Christ is the focal point of the entire Bible. He's the focal point of everything, history and everything. I mean, it's God. It's God. Jesus Christ is God. God the Son. You have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. And all of that equals one God. So anyway, <clears throat> um, some of the some of the prophecies, like uh, from the Old Testament, is that about concerning the Messiah that he was born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah chapter five. Born of a virgin. In Isaiah chapter 7, um, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David. And that is in uh, Genesis, um, 2 Samuel. Uh, Herod killing the infants. Remember when, when Jesus was born and then Herod went and uh, he was killing the, the infants. That was prophesied in Jeremiah, chapter 31. <clears throat> Taken to Egypt, Hosea 11. Heralded by the messenger of the Lord, which is John the Baptist. Isaiah chapter 40. Malachi chapter 3. Anointed by the Holy Spirit, Isaiah chapter 11. Preach good news, Isaiah chapter 61. Perform miracles, Isaiah 35. Cleanse the temple, Malachi 3. Ministered in Galilee, Isaiah 9. Entered Jerusalem as a king on a donkey, Zechariah chapter 9. Um, <clears throat> first presented himself as king 173,880 days from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Prophesy in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25. Rejected by the Jews, Psalm 118. Died a humiliating death, Psalm 22. Involving rejection, uh, betrayal by a friend, sold for 30 pieces of silver, silenced before his accusers, being mocked, beaten, spit upon, pierced his hands and feet, being crucified with thieves, praying for his persecutors, piercing of his side, Zechariah chapter 12, giving gall and vinegar to, to drink, Psalm 69. No broken bones, Psalm 34. Buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53. Casting lots for his garments, Psalm 22. Rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. <clears throat> okay. So those are just some of them, okay? This is not, that was not even a comprehensive list. There are many, many, many more. And I did not, I gave you some references if you want to look at it. But uh, <clears throat> it's also something you can look up. And, you know, if you want to, and, and you should. I, I encourage you to, to, uh, <clears throat> to definitely look up those things. So it's very specific the, who, about the who the Old Testament is talking about. It is talking about Jesus Christ. And um, also the Old Testament teaches that the Messiah, the coming Messiah, will be God himself. Um, <clears throat> in uh, Isaiah, right? And the government will be on his shoulder, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. And um, <clears throat> so, and then Jesus also straight up said that he was the Messiah. And he, he not only said that he was the Messiah, but he proved it by 
his actions, things like working miracles, forgiving sin, accepting worship, and many more. But, um, but it is clear who the Old Testament is talking about in the entire Jewish faith. So back in Acts chapter uh, 24, when you talk about <clears throat> verse 14, it says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So like these are Jews accusing him of what? They're really mad at him because he's preaching Jesus. He's preaching that, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is risen from the dead. And they're mad at that, even though it is an actual fulfillment of the very same scriptures that they claim to be following. And uh, so it's in the Old Testament, the, all those messianic prophecies pointing to exactly and identifying who the Messiah is and is in Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at just um, pure randomness, okay, they said, uh, here, here, I'll take, we'll take seven examples here of the messianic prophecies. So the first one, Jesus would be a descendant of David. The odds of that are one in 10,000, meaning at that time, in that place, approximately one out of every 10,000 of the population was a descendant of David. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That's one in 100,000. Jesus would be a miracle worker. One in 100,000. Um, I'm not exactly sure where they got that. I was just, just, just looking at this stuff. How do you calculate that? Um, Jesus would present himself as a king riding on a donkey. One in a million. Is that one in a million? By my guess, it could be, I don't know. Um, Jesus would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. One in a million. Jesus would be crucified. One in a million. So does that mean one out of every million people at that time around Jerusalem was crucified? Yeah, so that's something that could be calculated. Um, Jesus would first present himself as king, 1,000, I mean, 173,880 days from the decree of Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem. We'll call that one in a million. So, I mean, this is just an illustration, okay? Um, but those seven things, one in 10,000, one in 100,000, twice, and then one in a million, four times, total equals one in 100 billion, 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 billion. <laughs> so that's just, that's a number that you cannot even fathom. So the, I don't know, you, you take from that what you will. I thought it was interesting when I was looking at it, when I was uh, studying this week. But in other words, there's, there is no, um, there's no other person that it could be. It's the one, it's Jesus Christ. Now, um, other prophecies such that he would rise from the dead, you know, three days later. Now that's, that's a miracle also. Um, the fact that he would be a miracle worker. Jesus was the greatest miracle worker, right? Like his miracles are well documented. Um, thousands and thousands of eyewitnesses. How do you pull something like that off? You know, you just can't. You cannot fake it. The very same guy that the prophecies are pointing to is the guy who also pulled off miracles in front of um, tens of thousands of people uh, it's just it's crazy well I say it's crazy I mean it's just it, it boggles the mind right so anyway here we go back to Paul and um, he's talking about that he believes the, the, all the things written in the law and the prophets and the scriptures. He believes it. It's proven itself to be trustworthy. It's proven itself to be accurate, consistent, internally consistent, and everything else. Every other worldview breaks down except for Christianity. And um, 
and do say Christianity. Judaism breaks down because it can be proven that the Messiah has already come. Like we're saying, it's pointing to Jesus Christ. There could have been no other person that, that it was pointing to. So Judaism has now morphed into Christianity. But, um, you know, God had a different way of relating to people. The Old Testament is the, also the Old Covenant. Testament and covenant mean the same thing. New Testament, new covenant. Covenant meaning like a contract or like an agreement that he has with mankind, an agreement that God has. And so what's the agreement now? That we are saved by grace, received through faith in Jesus Christ. So that we cannot save ourselves, that we are sinners, that um, we are in need of salvation. Um, and that the only way to get, to get that salvation is to accept the gift that is offered to us by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross to offer himself as a sacrifice for us. And he's offering himself up as our perfect sacrifice, once and for all, one time sacrifice for all. Uh, there's no need to continuously offer sacrifices again and again the way they did in the Old Testament. That was only a, a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. So because of Jesus' perfect life, perfect sacrifice for us, and uh, offering us this perfect gift of salvation, we simply put our faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, that is the way which we receive the grace of God. And God is just offering us up this grace, this unmerited favor. It's something that we did not earn. And um, so it's, it can only be received. And it's received by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's it. <clears throat> putting your faith in Jesus Christ means... Um, <clears throat> It means more than simply believing in Jesus Christ. You know, it means believing in Jesus Christ and making the decision for yourself, for your life, to follow Jesus Christ with your life and to put your hope in Him. And when you do that, your, your entire hope of the future is in Jesus Christ. Your entire hope of salvation is in Jesus Christ. Then you can really re truly receive the grace of God. And um, the Holy Spirit will uh, live and dwell inside of you. God, um, you know, the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit in us is the first fruits of our inheritance as children of God. That's powerful. So it's something that, <clears throat> it's something that we enter into now in this life. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ that we enter into now. And uh, <clears throat> in verse 15, it says, I have, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So we're talking about Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, he, he was the first one to be resurrected. The, there were some that were re resuscitated, like Lazarus. You know, Lazarus uh, died and he was brought back. Jesus brought him back to life. But he was back in the same body who, have, <clears throat> you know, eventually died again. You, you know, but the resurrection is different. It's an eternal state. It's an eternal physical body. So we're not going to be just uh, ghosts or spirits or angels or anything. We're going to actually be in our physical bodies for eternity. And uh, Jesus Christ proved it. He proved that he conquered death by his own resurrection. And, um, and, he, and he also proved that his uh, sacrifice was accepted by God the, when he conquered death. So that now we can confidently put our faith in him, knowing that as surely as he rose from the dead, so too we will rise from the dead. And we will be resurrected. And as it says here, both the just and the unjust. So that means everyone is going to be resurrected. The ones who uh, put their faith in Jesus Christ will be resurrected into eternal glory. And those who rejected Jesus Christ will be resurrected into a physical body for all eternity 
to be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it's just, that's how serious it is, right? It is totally serious. Uh, that is no joke right there. Um, now, people don't go to hell on accident, though. They go to hell because they would, you know, that was their choice. And God gives them the choice. God gives them typically many, many chances because God does give us the best opportunity to be saved. We know that God, uh, from uh, I think it was chapter 17 of Acts, was talking about how God um, determines the times and the places that we would live so that we might seek Him, though He is not far from any one of us. And so the time and the place that you live, you know, you live in the 21st century in America or whatever the case is, that was your best chance to be saved. Or if you live on a, you know, whatever, in, in any span of time, it's God chose the boundaries of your dwelling so that you would seek him. And, um, and you know, people don't, people don't just go to hell in a technicality. It is an actual choice of theirs. And I don't know, I mean, it's hard to fathom what kind of a choice is that to suffer for all of eternity? I mean, if you have questions, questions have answers, right? It's understandable to have questions about the Bible, about religion, about Christianity, okay? Questions unanswered turn into doubt. And if, if doubt is not dealt with, it, it becomes unbelief. So, I mean, it's okay to seek out the answers to your questions. The fascinating thing about Christianity is the evidence is right there. It's right here. I'm talking about all the time in these sermons and stuff. It's, it's in the prophecy. It's in the, the spirit, test, the testimony of the saints and the, the spirit, the transforming, transforming work of the Holy Spirit on them. The, the eyewitnesses, um, you know, from the biblical times, or you could talk about just the testimony all the way up until today. Uh, the excellent morality, excellent morality of Jesus Christ, the, the beauty of it. I mean, no one could find anything to accuse Jesus Christ of, even when they, they killed him. And now, now they're also looking at his uh, servant here, Paul, and they're having trouble finding anything to really say about Paul, too. And his, his accusers didn't even show up in court. It's too embarrassing, right? So there's, there's nothing really you can say. Um, about the morality of Christianity. Now, sometimes people fail. Sometimes they do fail in, uh, in living up to the, the name of Christ. Sure, we all fail in that. But you can't say that Christ is teaching anything bad. Everything he's teaching is right because it's all about love. It's about loving God and loving your brother, loving your, the people around you. And, um, I mean... He who loves another has fulfilled the law. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Right? And, uh, and then there's also like just tons of evidence like what I'm always talking about. The, the manuscript evidence, the archaeology, the, uh, the scientific evidence for, um, <clears throat> for the, the, there has to be a creator in the universe. And then here we are. The creator of the universe has made the universe to be discoverable and created us to be able to discover it. But some of it goes down. It's not just a question of the mind, but it's a question of the will. Because Jesus even said, if, if the people don't believe the law and the prophets, they will not believe even if someone comes to them from the dead. Right? And Paul here was also talking about the law and the prophets and that he believes everything in it. So that's just, that's the mysterious thing about it. You know, you can look at all the evidence in the world. It means nothing to someone who is spiritually blind. But somebody can look in the Bible and it can open up their, their heart. It's the Holy Spirit that just works through the, the scriptures. And, um, and even without evidence, you know, initially, people don't really get saved based on evidence. They get saved because of their revelation from God. 
God touches you, your heart, you know, as you're generally as you're exposed to the word. So either you read it, someone reads it to you. Maybe you visit a church and you hear the word one way or another. You're exposed to the word of God. Uh, you say, what about people who, who never seen a Bible, people in a deserted island somewhere? Well, God still can reach them in his own way, maybe through a dream, a vision, whatever. Uh, anything, is hap- anything is possible with God. But when you're exposed to the word of God, and, um, and it's just something that just happens in your spirit, and it's the, that revelation from God where God opens your eyes, and you believe in him because of that because of how beautiful he is and uh, how awesome that and powerful that love is that's in God. And then you go back and you see the evidence and you realize, oh yeah, it does make sense. So that your, your rational brain also can function to, to uh, just to convince you that you've made the right decision and to help you explain to other people. But generally people don't, you know, it's... It's, it's something spiritual. It's not just something intellectual that, that brings you to God. But once you realize that, oh yeah, by the way, there was this not enormous pile of evidence that you just never noticed all those years you were living in darkness. And now you see the light. Now you can see that evidence for what it really is. So anyway, um, let's just pray. And... Uh, Call it a day, huh? Almighty God, please uh, help us in our Christian walk. Help us to to really come to Christ and to know Him through experience and through relationship and help uh, open our eyes up to, to uh, to the truth and the evidence that is there to support us and to support that truth and how true it is. And uh, help us to live the Christian lives that you want us to live. And uh, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.